on earth as it is in heaven. So we thank you for that, Father, that today we get to see another piece of heaven on earth. Let us be that body that you are dreaming of. Let us come into the fullness as sons and daughters of God to see you fully manifested in us and through us. Praise you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Awesome. I uh, grew up in Washington State in Spokane, Washington for a few years until I graduated high school. I moved to Seattle uh, after that. I did uh, university there and was part of, uh, back then, a city church with Wendell Smith. He was my pastor for a few years. Uh, Judah Smith was, was my youth pastor and then uh, got, moved to Dallas and then was part of a church plant in Ventura, California. We were there for nine years. Um, I helped establish and lead a Bible college there. And, uh, and now the Lord, three years ago, called us here. And as well, we planted a, a school of ministry that I get to oversee. And so one of my passions has been to just follow the Lord, follow the cloud. <laughs> Amen. To, uh, the scripture says that a man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. I had no idea that I was going to go from Spokane to Seattle to Dallas to Ventura to back to Washington, uh, to Vancouver, Washington. Actually, a few months before the Lord clearly spoke to us about Vancouver, uh, one of the things that I said, I said, I will never move to Vancouver, Washington or Spokane, Washington. I don't know why, uh, but never say never. I heard a, I heard a, a bishop one time say that song, sing that song, never say never. Uh, and so uh, here we are, praise the Lord. Um, I believe this morning, uh, I just was just seeking the Lord this week about what he would want to impart uh, into this house, into, into this people, into this region. Uh, and I felt the Lord just calling us as a body of Christ into more, into fullness, amen? Uh, the Lord has always wanted to do what he wants to do on the earth. He's wanted to establish his kingdom. He started to establish his kingdom but in his sovereignty and divinity and amazingness, he has chosen that on the earth, what he does on the earth is really connected to partnership with man. Amen? In Romans uh, chapter uh, 8, it says that the earth is even groaning. For what? The revealing of sons of God. Why? It says that the earth is groaning. It says our bodies are groaning for more fullness to be taken on, right? We're waiting for that glorified body. Our bodies are groaning. And it says that even as we pray in the Spirit, the Spirit groans in us. And then later on in that chapter, in I think verse 39, it says that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding. So we have the earth that's groaning. We have our bodies that are groaning. We have the Spirit of God within us groaning. And we have Jesus at the right hand of the Father interceding. What is their heartbeat and cry? It's for this one thing. The sons and daughters would come into fullness and maturity and be on earth as it is in heaven. If God could have done it or wanted to do it, I mean, he could have. But if he wanted to do it by himself, he would bypass us. But he as a father would not bypass partnering with his children because his greatest joy is not to do it for us but to do it with us come on for us as as earthly parents we get a glimpse of some of these realities God uh, allows us to experience on the earth relationships that show us a picture and a reflection of what he is like on earth how many know that how many of you have children <laughs> I have four of them. We have two biological kids, two that we uh, get to foster right now that we need to love on. And one of the things that I have realized and I'm thankful for is that I love when my kids grow up and mature into stuff. I love when they're children. I have a 13-month-old, and she just started walking like proficiently this week. She was walking a little bit, but now she's walking all the time. And I have been waiting and cheering that moment on. Now, I loved her when she was a baby, and I loved carrying her, but I'm glad that now she doesn't have to cry and get transported everywhere by mom or dad, but she can actually transport herself. And so we celebrate growth and development. That it's cool that I get to do things for her, but one of my greatest joys is for her to grow up and me to do things with her. Amen? There's something wired in us where it's like we don't want to just do something for someone the rest of their life. But there's enjoyment and fulfillment in doing it with them. And so there's this longing in the Lord that he says, I want my sons and daughters to grow up so that I no longer just have to do things for them, but I want to do things with them. He wants to rule and reign with us on the earth. 
He has called us not to just be his servants and slaves and for him to be our master, although that is a relationship we have with him, but he's called us to be heirs, to be sons, to be co-heirs with Christ, to, to rule and reign with him. His greatest joy and desire is that we would do it with him. Amen? And so there's this longing in the Lord where he says, I am longing for the, the manifestations of sons and daughters of God on the earth. He loves giving us the healing. He loves when we, even more, I think, when we grow up into saying, Lord, I know how to access what you already put in my account. He loves giving us provision. Could it be that he loves even more that when we grow up and we have the mind of Christ that we know how to access the provision? Amen? He loves to give things to his children. But he longs for the time when we can know how to be kings and priests and walk with him with that fullness manifested. So the... The message and the call this morning that I just felt the Lord wanted to call us into as the body of Christ is to come into fullness, to come into maturity, to come into greater things. We pray for revival. We long for revival. We speak revival. We long for more glory. Uh, in, its, in, in one sense, yes, let's continue to do that. But in another sense, the Lord longs for it even more. If we think that we're waiting for the Lord to release it, we're going to continue to be disappointed. The Lord has released it in seed form. It's for us to partner and release it with him on the earth. Oftentimes when we pray and we seek the Lord, it's we that become the answer for what we're praying for. We're like, Lord, do something. And the Lord's like, Vic, do something. Because when Jesus came and lived his life and he finished the work, he came and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. The place of sitting down is the place of finished and completion. And he says, now sons and daughters, rise up. I'm in you. I'm with you. Now you do the work. The things that we're longing for from heaven are in us in seed form and they're waiting for the maturity so that we can become the answer of God on the earth, amen? The things that we're longing for, we're the answer to. And so I just felt that the Lord wanted to encourage us for us to come into fullness because the greater glory, the revival that we wanna see is connected to our maturity. It's connected to us growing up into the fullness, into all things. In Ephesians chapter 4, it's one of my favorite passages. It's, God's given me so much revelation over the last few years in it. But specifically verses 1 through 16 have blown us up. And um, kingdom movement, just our church is built on the foundation of those 16 verses. But it says there in verse 12, it says that he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. But there was an unto there was a reason why he gave those gifts in the body of Christ. It says that when Christ ascended, then he gave these gifts to men. Meaning that these particular expressions of these gifts were not on the earth before that. It says when Christ ascended, he gave gifts to men. He gave some to be. Because from him, because in him is fullness. The fullness of the deity dwelt in bodily form in Jesus Christ. In him was fullness. Uh, it, John says of Jesus that, that he was given the spirit without measure. Jesus had the spirit without measure. And when he ascended, he said, now, I, I'm not, he, this is such an important principle. Hear this out. Jesus never gave the fullness of what he was ever to a single person or an individual. He gave himself to the body of Christ. He says, it's better that I go because the Holy Spirit will come and I'm going to actually give myself fully to the body, not to an individual. Because if there was an individual that fully had the full manifestation of the deity of what Jesus was on the earth, what would happen is 
We, we would no longer look to the, God. We would actually line up for that person, for him to touch us and heal us and to manifest all the things that we're looking for. But God, in his wisdom, said, I'm going to give myself to the body of Christ so that fullness happens on the earth as you honor, submit, yield, and work together. Because the head position's already filled. It's the body that needs to come up into fullness. Come on. So there's a principle that fullness only is transferred from the head to the body, never to an individual. An individual member can never carry the head and the fullness of it. It's the body that can. Okay, so we're going somewhere with this. So Christ gives these gifts to his body, the church, and he says, I'm going to I'm going to split myself into five, and unless you figure out a way to come into unity to honor one another, the world will not see me fully. They'll see me partially, but not fully. Because unless there's, and that's why the, in, in the first part of Ephesians chapter four, there's a call to, to dwell together in unity, to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, to do whatever it takes, to with all humility to honor one another. And so he gives these gifts, and it's, and it's spread across the body of Christ, but these gifts are given not to be the show and the answer for humanity, but actually to make the whole entire body look like the head. So Ephesians 4, 12, said the, 12 and 13 says that these gifts were given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So that every member becomes a functioning minister that is equipped by the head through the body. There are certain things that you'll never get directly from the head. You have to get it from the head like this, the body. Because he said, like, I'm going to give some things that are on the earth as a gift, and if you want them, you will have to honor another person. It protects us from isolation. Because sometimes we're like, you know what? People have hurt me so much, I'm going to lock myself into a room, and I'm just, I just need the Lord. And he said, hey, listen, I know you need me, but there's a part of me that I only gave that you will get through others. So we need the body. We need Christ. Christ in heaven and Christ on the earth. Amen? So we need the fullness, and there's a call for us to come up into fullness. So as we track down in Ephesians 4, it says that, that there's the equipping of the saints for ministry. But then there's my favorite part, and this is where I want to focus in on for the next few moments here, is that we're called to come up into fullness and maturity. And I want to read just a few passage, a few um, parts of this passage here. For the sake of time, I didn't like create slides and throw a bunch of scriptures. I just want to get the heart and the impartation of what God wants to release today. But it says here, in verse 13, so these gifts are given for the building up of the body of Christ. That's verse 12, Ephesians 4, 12. And then verse 13 says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to a mature person. So these gifts will continue to flow on the earth until there's full unity, until there's full maturity. So your destiny is not waiting on heaven to release it. It's waiting for our maturity. We're not waiting on the Lord. He's waiting on us to step into maturity. Galatians chapter 4 verse 1 says this, that as long as the heir is a child, they don't differ from what? a servant and a slave, even though they're the owner of everything. As long as the heir is still young and immature, they act like a slave even though they're the owner of everything. So they're still, because a slave and a servant is always asking to be given something instead of stepping in and saying, thank you, this is mine. So as long as we're still asking and begging and longing for things, maybe the air is still immature. As long as the air is a child, they don't differ from a slave. But the father is, 
there's an appointed time for the, the air and the sun to grow up so that the, those things can be passed on and the rightful owner, the partner, can take his place. Amen? So there is this need for us to grow up into all things. So verse 13, the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. So that mature man, it explains it now, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Let me explain that for a minute. We're supposed to grow up into maturity until we look like the fullness of Christ. Every member mature to the fullness of Christ. And the longing of the Lord is he wants to come back and marry a mature, spotless bride. Not, a, not one that's like has a seed of the spotless, but on the outside is really crippled, maimed, and still fleshly and childish. Child, childish, yeah. He's, could it be that he's given everything we need for life and godliness on the earth, and he's waiting, and he's sitting in heaven interceding for us to step into it because he's longing to marry a pure, spotless, mature bride. The full measure of the stature of Christ. That's what he's longing for to come to. That's when he comes. That's when he comes. When we, when we figure out this unity, this maturity, this fullness of Christ. Verse 14, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by every wind of doctrine and trickery of people and craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth and love, we are to grow up into all aspects. Are you seeing the theme over and over again? As soon as Jesus releases the gifts, they're for the equipping of the saints for the building up of the body into maturity. And so I just sense that the, this is what the Lord is doing on the earth. This is what the Lord is doing in this hour. He's longing for us to shake ourselves off of that slavery orphan mindset because sometimes what happens in the church is that God will start to reveal to people what he's doing on the earth and oftentimes the first ones that get it are the, like the artists and the worshipers. They'll start to sing it before the theologians ever pick it up. And then, it's, so it'll come through those that like see and hear and they're artistic and they flow with the Lord and he starts to show them these things. And then the intellects are like, oh, I think God's doing something on the earth. We better discover this in theology and matriculate and articulate it into the fabrics of society, right? And so they're a little bit slower because they're so heady sometimes and they haven't opened themselves up to have those <laughs> experiences with the Lord. But, and so God's doing something on the earth and he's wanting us to shake free from stuff. But sometimes what we've done is we've adopted the language of sonship, but the expression is still we have the same orphan mindset. The danger with revelation is you can adopt the language, but never actually become the function of it. The danger is, is that we, we, un we understand we have a a gnosis in the Greek, a knowing, a knowledge that we're children of God, but we don't have a gnosko, an experience, an encounter, and we're not the manifestation of the sons of God. And there's evidences of what that looks like in our life. We, we, we pick up the language, we use the, the term father and daddy God, and, and, and he provides for me, but then when anything happens, we're like back to square zero, and we're like freaking out. Because we've picked up the language, but there's not like the manifestation of sonship. So there is a call. It's a sober call to say that the Lord is saying, I love my church. I love my body. I love my children, but I'm longing for more maturity because this is connected to the Lord getting his inheritance on the earth. Because the harvest is his inheritance. And it's waiting for us. And so the Lord himself is longing. He loves us where we're at, but he's longing that we come out of that place. What would it be if my 13-month-old daughter never progressed from this state? A year, two, three, four went by. She still can't talk. She falls down. We would say that something is wrong there. 
And even though my love would never change, there's something wrong. Can God love us and yet still be longing for us to walk into something more? His father's heart doesn't change, but he said, when will you grow up so that you can be a partner instead of me having to spoon feed you everything? Where you can be a son in the house and you can go and get that water and go and get that food by yourself. Because right now, our little girl, Emmy, she asks for everything. She points and says, this, this, you know. And we have to like spoon feed it to her. And that's beautiful. I love it. And it's good for a season, but it's not good when that turns into a decade and two decades. The thing that's beautiful for a season becomes like a sore in your side after a while. Right? And so there's this longing for God for us to come into maturity. In the journey of our growth and development, oh, uh, I want to just, there's so many thoughts I want to hit, but we're going to hit just a couple here. And then there's going to be just this call, and I want to make it very practical, because I feel like there's, there's five practical tools or principles I want to give you to help us like get unstuck because I feel like there's places where we've been stuck in the body of Christ where we haven't matured past the stage where we've been in a cycle and we're, we're asking for more, we're longing for more, we're getting more theology for more, but we're staying here. And we've gotten stuck and we've gone into some cycles of things and I believe God wants to get us unstuck and there's some, some principles and truths in scripture that set us free because Jesus said, in John 8, 32, that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That there's a transforming that needs to happen in our lives. Because when God does things, he gives things always in like a seed form and then he asks us to partner into the maturing and growing of it. If you look throughout the teachings of Jesus and throughout scripture, you'll actually see that, you know, Jesus told parables like this master came and he gave like, eat, like, uh, 10 guys or something, one mina each. And then one guy turned it into more, one guy a little bit less, and one guy just kept it as one. And their reward was based on what they did with what they were given. But the seed form was given equally as far as the minas were concerned. But what someone did with it was now not based on the master, it was based on the servant. And then the reward when the master returned was completely based on the level of partnership, not the level of like love. In relationship, it was based on the level of partnership. Because for some people, because all our, all our works and all of what we're doing will be tested by fire, and only what withstands the fire will remain. Some people will come into eternity because they came in by faith, and that's the only way we can come in and stay in. But all of their works are unto nothing, and so the, Paul says in Corinthians that they themselves are like come in barely escaping the flames of fire. But there's nothing. Here is the king of kings that gave everything. And we can't even get a crown to give back to him and say, my king, thank you that you gave me everything. Here's the crown that I got for you. I want to give this to you. That we can lay something at his feet. Because our king is worthy. And so our work and our maturity is connected not to salvation, but it's connected to it's connected to his reward. It's connected to his joy. So God gives things in seed form, and then they grow and mature. It's interesting, in Genesis 2, 17, I'll just throw this out there. You're going to have to go study this out. But there's a, it says this, that in the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will certainly die. And that's what most translations say. You will surely die. You will certainly die. If you look at the Hebrew original idiomic version of that, it actually says that dying you shall die. Sometimes we think that the moment Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, they instantly died. And we're like, okay, well, they didn't physically die. Their soul was still intact. They still could think, so what died? And we think that they spiritually died in, in a moment, in an instant. Um, I want to propose to you that actually what happened when they ate of it is that, they, that sin entered the world and began in seed form and began to grow. That in dying, they would die. But it was a seed form. Because everything God gives us is in a seed that must be cultivated and grow up into fullness. The same thing with eternal life. 
when we eat of the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ, we eat of him, guess what happens? We get a deposit, we become pregnant with the seed of who he is. But whether we ever see the maturity of the stature of Christ, that no longer depends on the seed giver, but it depends on us stewarding the seed. So we are given eternal life and it grows up and grows up and grows up into the manifestation of the sons of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So for us as human beings, when we sin, guess what happens? Sin enters us and starts to kill us and we're slowly dying. And then we eat of the tree of life, Jesus Christ by faith, and then there's a seed of life but it doesn't happen, it doesn't, it's not given to us in full maturity. There's fullness there, but it must come into maturity. So there's this process of growth in death, and there's a process of growth in life. There's a progression. That's why we see like a progression of evil. Like all throughout scripture, you see that, you know, in, in Genesis 6, that it got so bad that God was like, this is no longer redeemable because now we have the, the sons of God, daughters of men, all this corruption. He's like, I actually can't redeem this. I have to cleanse this and start over. Because it, it got so uh, progressively destructive. So it entered as a seed and it grew to this thing that could no longer be redeemed. The humanity, it was actually a cleansing for God to start and, and really preserve his promise that through, through the seed of, of the Son of Man that he's going to save the earth. Anyways, we won't go into that, but the point is this. God gives things to us in fullness, but in a seed form. So have we been by his stripes healed? Yes. Then why are we still dealing with sickness, disease, and death? Because it's in a seed form and we must become mature and draw on the things that have been deposited into our account and they must start to produce the fruit of what was given to us. Has he provided for us? Yes. Has he protected us? Yes. Is the finished work done? Yes. By him and it's deposited into us as a seed, it must grow. And so this is the progression of our Christianity and our life, and this is what actually Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father saying, my child, I can't wait for you to become a man so that I can actually be fully manifested on the earth and have all of my desire on the earth. My child, I love you, but I don't want you to remain a child because you're still acting like a slave asking me to do everything for you and actually you're the heir, but you need to come up into it. The progression of our Christianity must look like this, and some people get stuck on phase one. And it's like, the first thing that the gospel does, because grace doesn't come to just give us uh, everything, although it does give us everything, but grace actually comes to set us free from the law of sin and death. You can actually be free. We can live free. So many times we don't grow out of the place where they're like, we're unmixed. And we're still like, we allow like the perfect incorruptible seed of God, but we allow with old mindsets and habits and actions for like mixture to come in. Mixture in our thinking, mixture in our theology, mixture in our expression. And we don't grow up and it's hard for us to reach the final level where we look like Jesus because we haven't even learned how to actually live free. But the gospel and grace was given to set us free. Grace has a destination and it looks like Jesus. Grace is Jesus to make you look like Jesus. Grace isn't just a license and a freedom to do whatever you want to do, but it's actually the ability and the seed to transform you into who he is. So being free from sin is the first stage of a believer actually coming into, into growth and maturity free from sin. And this is something that the Lord wants for his church. We're asking for more revival and more glory, and yet we're still stuck just with sin, let alone like intimacy with the Lord and then like looking like him and manifesting him on the earth. We're still stuck on phase one. We're still struggling with our sin. And he's come to set us free. And uh, there's a, just a pandemic in the body of Christ where people have adopted Christian theology, but then they also will allow the mixture 
of sin and a sinful lifestyle to be okay in the life of a believer and say like, well, God accepts me just as I am. God accepts you as you are. But then there's who you're becoming and your actions and he's, he wants that to be purified. So are we pure in his sight? Yes, that's our identity. But must we come into maturity and manifest that purity? Yes. So there's this already but not yet in all of the gospel. Are we saved? Yes. Are we looking more like Jesus? Yes. So which one is it? Yes. <laughs> Wait, so is it finished or is it becoming? Uh-huh. <laughs> right? But the mindset is, Jesus, thank you that it's finished, that I never have to do this again. So I'm renewing my mind unto the finished work so that I can manifest that. Rather than making an excuse and saying, God accepts everything, he loves everything. No, he loves you. He doesn't love the thing that's killing you. And so he wants us to be free. Man, this was supposed to be an introduction to get to the five things that make us free. And so we don't have time. Let me just run through them really fast. But it's, it's principles for us to be unstuck and go to where God's calling us to be. So can I just do five more minutes? We'll try to do one minute each, five things, and we're going to close this out. Help me, Lord. The first thing that causes transformation in our life is, is repent. And that word has taken on a wrong connotation. Repent literally means a change of your mind. It's a surrender to him and it's a changing your mind. Like I used to think that I am the man and now he's the man, you know? I changed my mind. But you can't even start to be transformed until the seed of God comes into you and you become a slave of righteousness and you're freed from slavery to sin. But some people are trying to add to their humanity uh, godliness and they're trying to do it through religion. Like Paul, before he met Christ, he tried to, through the Jewish system of law and the scriptures, become godly. And, and, and the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the teachers, they, they wanted to do this. But Jesus clearly pointed out, inside there's dead man's bones, but on the outside you've washed the outside of the cup, but inside it stinks. Meaning like the religion that you've added on to your humanity didn't actually transform the inside, so you're actually still at step zero. You have to repent, come to me to have life. He said, you search the scriptures diligently, thinking the scriptures will give you eternal life. Eh. You must come to the word, Jesus, to have life. That's John 5, 39. So they, they were trying to, through religion, and a lot of religions are doing that. They're, like people are cheering for morality because immorality looks really disgusting in the world. It looks like w ridiculous things like, you know, I don't know, we, we, I don't even want to name a bunch of these things. But it looks like really nasty stuff in the world. So the world is cheering for morality and almost preaching morality. But it doesn't even start until you repent and get life in you. How can you produce what Christ likeness is unless it gets in you? You can kind of fake it on the outside in, but on the inside, you're still dead man's bones, right? So the first step is repentance. Now, the cool thing with repentance is not a one-time act because we must continue to renew our mind. So number one to us being unstuck is just repentance because there's some people that are going to church, but they've never actually had new life on the inside of them. The core of their desires aren't transformed. They actually love their sin. They, but they feel kind of shame because they know better because of the law of the conscience. And so they're struggling, but they've never actually had new life in them. And for a person that's there, the Lord calls you to actually become a new creation, to repent. Number two, going slower than I wanted. Help us, Lord. I don't want to get these out of order. Number two is... Um, is this important principle of, I'm going to call it recognize, because we're going to try to use some R's here. So repent and recognize. And this idea is you actually have to admit that you're stuck and that, you, that there's something unhealthy and broken in you. When you look at yourself like, yes, you're a believer. Yes, you're a child of God. Yes, you've been walking with God for 20 years. But there is some junk in your life that you're not willing to actually open up because you think that you'll be rejected. And sometimes we give in to shame 
and we're afraid for anyone to see what is really going on. So we don't allow anyone to recognize what's really happening. We don't open up. We don't live open. And so we stay stuck. But God gives grace to the humble. The most humble thing we can do is to actually open up our life. Can I tell you, for, for, for some of us in this room, your key to actually growing up into all things to manifest Christ is we must come to this place where you are now open with your life. You're open with your life. You're open with your struggles. You're open with your desires. Because sometimes when you even just give voice to something that's like a sin or a cycle in your life, the moment you even say it, you'd be like, I know that's not who I am. But when you hide it, it seems like it's who you are. Because deception grows in secrecy. But in the light, things are exposed and healed. So this idea of walking in the light, let's actually believe and walk in the theology that we're talking about. Let's actually be sons who are not afraid and not ashamed, that are open. That we, we recognize and admit there's something wrong with me and I'm gonna live in community and be, op be open with it. We could go so much deeper, but the third thing is, is a renewing of our mind. Because scripture actually only gives you two ways to be transformed. Did you know that? The word transformed, metamorpho, is only used four times in scripture. Twice about Jesus' transfiguration and twice about our transfiguration. Only twice in all of scripture will you see the idea that we must be transformed, transfigured, metamorphosized into a different form. And there's only two scriptures to it. It's Romans 12, 2, and then it's 2 Corinthians 3, 18. But let's hit Romans 12, 2. Do not conform believers to the patterns of this world, to the thinking of this world, but be transformed, transfigured by changing the way you think renewing your mind every bad behavior in our life is connected to a bad belief the fruit of every action is always what you believe you know that you never actually have to try to change a behavior you only need to target a belief as you believe right you'll behave right without any effort we could go on that for a while but there's this principle here where have you been stuck in something because your mouth is saying the right thing, but inside you believe the wrong thing. Can I encourage you? Maybe the Lord is calling you into a place where you're going to go and renew your mind with Scripture, and you're going to actually read and let things become a revelation to who you actually are so that you can be free from that. Amen? So repent, recognize, open up, and then renew your mind, which is also a continual form of repentance. We continually transform our thinking. Okay, and then the next one is, is behold. It's the 2 Corinthians um, 3.18 passage. But we, with unveiled faces, looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. That's that word. Into his image from glory to glory. So you become what you behold. Could it be that you're still stuck and not growing in some stuff because you're looking at the wrong things? You're not looking at him. Like, you come to worship times, but you're not looking at him because you become what you behold. You manifest what you think, and you become what you behold. What if we believed right and beholded him? I'm telling you, those things would fall off of our life. And then the last thing is this. We're going through this so fast. Is, is be radical. So behold and be radical. <laughs> Jesus said that if your arm or your foot or your eye causes you to stumble or sin, like cut it off. What was he saying? Should we like amputate parts of our body? No, because the sin's not in the body part. The sin's in our heart. He's saying be willing to do whatever it takes. Like how radical are you willing to be? How radical are you willing to, maybe there's friends in your life. Maybe there's things that you're watching. Maybe there's the entertainment. Maybe there's things that have kept you bound and you need to actually be radical. Some people might not understand it, but your radical devotion is your worship to the Lord. Come on, God's calling us up into transformation so that we can transform the world so that we can actually see greater glory and revival on the earth. Can I tell you, it's not connected just to our prayers. Let's continue to pray, but it's connected to our maturity. Jesus, would you show us those areas that we have, sh that we have had hidden that you want to expose? Father, we just declare, God, would you do surgery in our life? We ask that your fire would come and burn away. It doesn't burn us because we're your sons, but it burns away the things that's killing us, Lord. So we ask for your fire, Lord. 
Transform us, O oh God. Make us like you. Let us be the answer of God on this earth. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, God. We love you, Jesus. I'm going to invite the miracle team to just come forward. If you, if you want to respond, you want the Lord to do something, you want to see a, 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 the step of transformation where you've been stuck. You've been a believer, but you want to go to the next step. Or maybe you, you thought you were a believer and you want to be, become a believer. Would you just come? Just let the ministry team, the miracle team, just come and minister to you. Amen. So, Father, we just honor you. We bless you. We thank you. Thank you for this family. Thank you for this body of Christ. We bless Bethesda. We thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing on the earth. In Jesus' name.